Hey everybody, I'm Tim. Welcome to Augmented Biology, where we'll explore my fascination with the biomedical field. The first few videos on this channel will be an overview of work I've already done, as this channel comes in the middle of a multi-year project to make a better prosthetic hand. If you like what you see here and want to follow along on this adventure, please consider subscribing, and maybe dropping a like on the video. This video will be an overview of why I decided to make a prosthetic hand as well as what factors influenced the development of its overall function. I first decided to make a prosthetic hand after reading the appetizingly titled An Overview of the Developmental Process for the Modular Prosthetic Limb. The MPL is awesome. It uses incredibly cutting-edge technology to create what truly is the most realistic prosthetic experience ever. It has a wider range of motion than a natural hand in almost every degree of freedom, and even has a neurologically linked sense of touch that can detect pressure, movement, and heat. However, as I read more into the MBL, the impracticality of the system became apparent. Each unit costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the nerve mapping surgeries are also incredibly expensive. I decided a more cost-effective solution must exist, and I decided that I wanted to make that solution. According to research found on PubMed, links in the description, 75.7% .7 of limb amputees who have a prosthetic use it frequently. However, modern prosthetic hands demonstrate much lower use rates, with 56% of those surveyed saying they rarely or never use their prosthetic hand. The main reasons patients give for this huge disparity in prosthetic use are discomfort, poor aesthetic quality, and obsolescence. Let's break these complaints apart one at a time to understand them better. Discomfort is a massive factor for most socket-based prosthetics. These are prosthetics that use a flexible sleeve to grip onto the stump to support the prosthetic. These sleeves tend to be non-breathable, and they rub against the amputee's skin, causing friction and sometimes blistering. Prosthetic hands suffer from this problem even more, as they experience twisting and pulling forces as part of their normal function, both of which cause even more friction against the skin. Prosthetic hands are made to be realistic looking, but without a professional cosmesis to recreate the look of skin, they often fall into the uncanny valley. These designs look more like a doll's hand than a real one, and can draw unwanted attention to the amputee. This most likely comes from the color of the prosthetic being too close to skin, and the form of the prosthetic being too close to the form of a human hand, but in both ways lacking the detail that a biological hand would have. Often amputees find their prosthetics to be less useful than their stump. Most prosthetics on the market don't have individual finger control and lack the ability to pronate their wrists. And most tasks that require two hands require fine motion control of both hands, like tying your shoes or playing an instrument. This means that prosthetic hands without fine motion control, which is most prosthetic hands on the market, are in many ways worse than a stump. They're less comfortable, they get pretty much the same things done, and they can't feel. To combat these failings of current generation prosthetic hands, my design would have to be comfortable to wear for an entire day, support a cosmesis while not falling into the uncanny valley, have close to natural flexion and extension speeds, individually articulable fingers, full range of motion, and an average grip strength. The first major design choice for my prosthetic hand was to make it osseointegrated. This involves the implantation of an anchor into the bone, which secures the rest of the implant directly to the patient's skeletal system. I chose this method because having a direct link from the prosthetic to the bone solves the comfort problem created by tight sleeves used in socket designs. The implants themselves are usually titanium and treated to be very rough and hydrophilic, which allows the body to better accept them. Osseointegration is already a common technique for internal implants and is becoming much more popular as a method of attachment for limb prosthetics. Next came the design for the hand itself. I considered five different designs, all of which could in theory meet my engineering goals. First was a muscularly driven hand. This would work by attaching artificial tendons to the remaining FDP or FDS tendons in the forearm, and using those artificially implanted tendons to directly control finger flexion. The precise method for how these tendons would go from inside the body to inside the prosthetic, without communicating disease to the body, wasn't considered, for the purposes of ranking designs, I just assumed that the interchange could be done successfully. The second design was nearly identical to the first, except it had a motorized abduction, whereas the first design couldn't abduct at all. 
The third design that was considered was a fully motorized hand. This would be similar to how the modular prosthetic limb was constructed, with a motor at every joint to directly control motion. The last two designs were also tendon-based, where a flexor tendon would transfer force from a motor unit in the palm to the whole finger. I considered using an electric motor and a MAP gas-powered piston as my motor units for each design respectively. Even before I got to the formal decision-making process, I ruled out the fully motorized hand. It was much too close to the modular prosthetic limb, and would almost certainly come with a similarly prohibitive price tag. I am just a student, and I can't personally fund projects that cost more than my house. I used a series of decision matrices to evaluate the other four designs as quantitatively as possible. The first of these compares the mechanical functions of the designs. The muscle-driven hand has great flexion speed and strength, because these numbers will in theory be perfectly identical to a biological hand. It will use passive extension, and so extension speed is great, but extension strength is lacking. The lifespan for this design should be great as well, most likely only brought down by the tendon interface between the body and the prosthetic. The muscle and motor design has the benefits of the muscle-driven, with the added bonus of being able to abduct, meaning it will have a higher range of motion. However, adding in the motors to facilitate abduction results in complexity that will lower the usable lifespan. The motor and tendon design will have slow actuation due to a higher gear ratio being required to generate appropriate grip forces, and the map gas and tendon design will have great speed but terrible lifespan, as it is basically a small internal combustion engine inside the palm. The next matrix compares how comfortable the designs will be for the patient. Both the muscle-driven designs require surgery and physical therapy to use, so the recovery scores will be a lot lower. However, the muscle-driven design has the easiest learning curve because it controls exactly like a biological hand. All the other designs will need some amount of electrode control to tell the hand when and how to move. Learning to control the prosthetic in this way would require a small amount of physical therapy, so no perfect scores in that category. The final decision matrix evaluates the designs based on how easily I can make them. The muscle-driven hand leads this by far because it requires no electronics and all I'd need is a 3D printer. The map gas falls far behind because fabricating combustion chambers and the valve systems to control them is something I don't have the resources to do. After this consideration, the muscle-driven design was chosen. It had by far the highest score across the three decision matrices and a unique method of function that would be a worthy pursuit for research. While there are several downsides to the implantation of artificial tendons into the forearm, the benefits of increased speed and control for the user make it well worth designing this type of prosthetic.